So welcome everybody who's just joined. We're just going to hang on a minute or two just to make sure everybody um, can participate. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, so today we're going to talk about engineering for global challenges. So my name is Dr. Shirley Coyle, and I'm a lecturer in the School of Electronic Engineering in DCU. And I'm joined here today with my colleague, Dr. Rajani Bijur Rajavan, um, and she's a researcher in the iForm Research Centre, um, also in the School of Electronic Engineering. Um, so just before we start, just to let you know that this uh, webinar is going to be recorded and um, but obviously because it's a webinar that doesn't affect you so your cameras won't be shown or anything and um, so it's just our presentations that are being recorded and um, you'll also see that there's no chat available but if you have questions there is the Q&A option so um, please do type in your questions and we'll try and keep an eye on those questions throughout the presentations and if we don't get to them and um, we'll answer them at the end. Okay, so to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today, um, we'll start off by just introducing the concept of sustainability and what that's all about. And then we're going to look at some different global challenges um, that affect our world today. And um, so I'm going to talk about global health and then look about sensors and how we can sense the world using technology. And then I'm going to hand over to Rajani and she's going to talk about some of the grand challenges like food and water and energy. She's going to talk a bit about climate change and then talk about different types of renewable energy and green energy. And then we'll wrap it all up with some Q&A at the end. So just to get started, I'd like to know your ideas on sustainability and find out um, what you understand about sustainability. So I'm just going to launch a poll here. So, oh. Is, sorry, this is um, the wrong poll. So sustainability first. So how well do you understand the term sustainability? I'll just leave the poll open for a minute or two. Okay, so most people have voted now, and I'm going to share the results with you. And it, it's great um, that most people, the majority of people are very aware, um, and some people have excellent knowledge. So most people have heard of it to some level. Okay. So, it's moving on. So if we look at the definition of sustainability, so according to the UN World Commission, sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And I, I like this definition, which is, says enough for all forever. And that just 
sums it up um, in a very nice, concise, concise way. And when you think about sustainability, a lot of people just focus on the environment and think it's just about environmental impact. But when we talk about sustainable design, it's about thinking about broader than that. So this, this is, these are the three pillars of sustainability. So you have to think about the economy and about how you can have growth and development and how that impacts society and how, you, how communities can thrive. And to do that all while looking after the environment and thinking about natural resources. So when we have sustainable development and sustainable de design, you really need to look at all those three factors and bring all those factors in when you're designing a system. So I have another poll um, to see, have you heard about the UN's sustainable development goals? And we're gonna talk a bit about those today. So I'm just gonna launch our next poll. And just the last one's coming in. Okay, and I'm gonna share the results with you now. So yeah, the majority of people have, so nearly three quarters of people um, know about them, which is great. So I'm just gonna play a short video here. It's just about a minute long and it runs through the 17 sustainable development goals. And this is just, um, a nice little video. I'm just going to share the sound before I show it to you. Okay, so what's nice about that is that everybody needs to be involved in, in, develop, in um, achieving these goals. So there's 17 goals to find. It was a quick run through of them. Um, and there's actually 169 targets as well. And these goals were defined um, by the UN member states who met in 2015, and they created a 15 year plan to achieve these goals. And th the aim of these is to reduce poverty, reduce hunger, and to, to protect the planet for the future and to create a better world for everybody. So what can we do as engineers? Um, how, can, how can we achieve these goals? And engineers have a really important role to play in this because engineering involves problem solving. So engineers can look at technical solutions to, to be, develop creative solutions to some of these challenges. So today we're going to look at a few examples of how engineering can, pro can provide solutions to some of the challenges. And I think everyone would agree that the COVID pandemic is one of the biggest challenges for today. And you can see from this map that it's affecting every single part of the globe. And the big problem with COVID is that because it spreads when people before people get symptoms or if people don't have if they're to be asymptomatic. And the reason for that, of course, is that we have all these restrictions. Um, and um, just to, to look at that then, how engineering is involved in, in um, deciding those restrictions. So there was huge debate over whether it was one meter or two meter. So from an engineering point of view, we can look at a different model. So there's been a lot of research in the last year seeing how far does a cough or a sneeze travel. 
So I've taken a couple of examples from some research that's been carried out where they simulate sneezes or coughs and look at the movement of droplets and then they can figure out, well, is it gone one meter or two meters? So on the, in the image in the center, you can see they're using these phosphorescent particles and camera imaging to look at spread and the transmission of droplets. Um, and then on the right hand side, engineering is used then to actually model the airflow and look at the effects of, um, of air movement and um, you know, to understand how a cough or a sneeze would move. Sorry, I'm just gonna keep an eye on here on the Q&A, okay. And obviously as well, that kind of simulation, those kind of experiments can look at the effectiveness of different face masks and um, you know, how, how good they are at filtering out um, the, the air and the particles in it. So one of my, my main research areas is in wearable technology. Um, so I'm very interested in, in how wearables can be used um, to look at people's health and at the moment how, how this can be used um, you know, to tackle the, the problem with COVID. And so some of you might be familiar with the COVID tracker where you can look at people's contacts and, and whether they've been in contact with somebody who's been, um, uh, if, who's had COVID, um, have, they, have they been in contact with that person for longer than 50 minutes? Um, but not everybody uses a smartphone. So that technology can actually be put into wearable devices like in a bracelet or um, on a watch or um, you know, on a piece of jewelry you put around your neck. Um, so for populations that wouldn't necessarily use smartphones like in children or in the elderly who are based in nursing homes, wearable technology could be used to look at um, seeing if somebody has been within two meters of a positive case or not. And so wearable technology can use to look at um, you know, people's movements. A lot of people are probably used to wearing smartwatches or fitness tractors. And those can be used to, to sense people's activity. So you know, the original thinking is, is for fitness and looking at people's well-being. Um, watches and smart garments can look at vital signs like your breathing rate, your heart rate, and also look at sleep patterns and link that then to stress. Um, and th those technologies have been used then if, because they can give a personal pattern. So give you an idea of your own personal physiology and what's normal for you. So if um, there's a change in somebody's sleep patterns or their breathing rate, that can signal that they're coming down with something. So there's been studies to show that um, they can figure out if somebody is coming down with an infection. So it means you could identify somebody who's possibly coming down with COVID symptoms before they actually are aware of those symptoms. Another area of research for wearable technology um, that I've been involved in as well is in sweat analysis. That's quite a new area where you can look at uh, different markers in sweat and use that to diagnose people or to detect illness um, but, you know, before traditional symptoms appear. So wearables can be used um, to detect for early detection of illness, but also they're very important then for monitoring people. So it can take some of the pressure off hospitals by having people um, monitored at home. So for example, with, with looking at COVID, um, oxygen levels are really important. And there's something called silent hypoxia, which happens when people might not necessarily be out of breath, but their blood oxygen level is very low. And you can see sometimes in the, in the chemists they're selling pulse oximeters. But a wearable device can do that and in quite a non-invasive way, an unobtrusive way, um, can monitor somebody's health and then that can be linked to the hospital and the, the clinicians can monitor them remotely. And so it means then you can pick up if somebody's deteriorating quickly and get them to hospital as soon as possible then. And another area then, this is quite new technology, new innovations in terms of masks. So everybody is wearing masks and they're going to be around for a while longer. Um, so this is an example from LG and um, it's called the PuriCare. And this one, this is a short video here. So this device, it filters the air. It also, so aside from just um, viral and bacterial particles, um, it will also filter out air pollution. So even beyond when hopefully we get past COVID, this will be useful for people who may be commuting in a very um, congested um, place with lots of traffic. So to reduce traffic fumes um, or people who have respiratory illnesses that need um, 
that are quite sensitive to, to air pollution. And there's a few of these masks coming on the market at the moment. This is another one called by AirPop um, with a halo sensor. And so this has, um, you can see the circular sensor there, picks up the breathing as the person breathes in and out, and it links it to their phone and that circle on the phone expands and contracts or glows as in sync with the person's breathing. And there are other masks as well that link to your phone and link to microphones to improve um, the sound going through that can be affected by masks as well. So you can see that the sensors are being integrated into so many of our everyday objects. And, you know, it's, it's we've seen the Internet of Things and it's becoming the Internet of Everything. And these sensors can provide huge amount of information about our lives. So at home, we can have smart homes. It can be about our, how we travel, making smarter workplaces, making workplaces safer, and also monitoring the environment. And so gathering all that ends up with huge amounts of data. And, you know, this big data then can be used to inform better decisions and to make our lives better, make things work more efficiently and be used to create sustainable designs. So an example of sensing the world um, is the development of a smart city. So you can have lots of different sensors in different aspects of the city to improve um, the way people live and how efficient things run. So as an example, it could be within the environment. So looking at smart bins and making sure that they're being collected on time or looking at using drones for looking at legal dumping in certain areas. Um, it can relate to the economy. So looking at um, say footfall in certain streets so businesses can plan better and provide better services. Mobility is all about the transport and improving um, the efficiency of transport and also its effect on the environments and um, so reducing traffic congestion. And then within government, using all that data then to decide on future policies and how can, you know, how can the government meet the needs of, of the people better by using um, all that data. And then for people living in the city to engage them as well and to create a better infrastructure for their lives and improve their quality of life. So I've a couple of examples here of how sensing and technology can be used within a smart city and achieve some of these goals. So, for example, looking at mobility um, and we have the Dublin bike scheme. So with an app on your phone that can link to, um, to the bike and, and, and you can rent bikes, you're reducing, saving time rather than walking, but also then reducing the amount of traffic that's that's going through the city, which again will affect um, the environment and reduce air pollution and our carbon footprint. Another thing with mobility, another example of this is to have smart parking. So an example here um, of sensors that are made by Siemens where they have um, radar put onto buildings. And these this radar can be used then to identify where objects are so it can identify where there's parking spaces and then this can link to people's phones and people's cars so they're not driving around the block loads of times looking for parking spaces and again adding to traffic congestion um, and, and more traffic on the, on the roads in, in the city. Then again linked to um, the roads so for all types of commuters not just cars but also cyclists and people and footprints, foot, footpaths um, so flooding is a big problem um, and can affect businesses and shops getting flooded and damaged. And this is a, um, an interesting project by the Smart um, Dublin Initiative, and it's called Gully Spy. So it has sensors put into the drains and it can monitor then the level of water and also whether drains are getting blocked. So if the leaves are all blocking the drains, that can cause flooding, local flooding on the roads. Um, so it's a nice example of a project where you can identify where there's a problem and, and um, contact the local authorities before um, you know, a big flood risk happens um, within the area. And then again, following on from that with water. Um, so water, I suppose, would traditionally be associated with, with civil engineering, but obviously with sensing, um, electronic engineering um, and different types of engineering are all involved in the management of water. Um, which affects all aspects of our life. So sea swimming has become very popular. And this um, graph here I've taken from the Environmental Protection Agency. 
and it shows different bathing locations um, on the, uh, the coastline of Dublin Bay where measurements will be taken up for water quality. And then this is all um, uploaded online. You can access this data in real time. So really important for people's health because certain times of the year when there's very heavy rain, um, excess pollution or excess wastewater can run into the sea and that can pose a risk for people's health. So having all this data can just provide um, much more, uh, empower people to make better decisions and to, to look at their health, health and their, their lifestyles. And I just have one more example before I hand over. Um, and this is another example linked to water um, and to do with the efficiency of water and also linked to, um, so we linked to the, the providing food as well. So in countries where there's drought, by actually managing the, the water more efficiently, um, we can you know, improve farming and improve crop yield. So in this case, we have a um, smart irrigation system that will measure the, the moisture content in the soil, but also be linked to the weather so that you're not wasting water and only watering the crops when it's needed. And there's an example here um, of a product by a company called Arable, which has um, soil and weather sensors. So these are put into the ground and it's all wirelessly connected and will inform the farmer then um, when things need to be um, based on the type of crop and also uh, based on the, the weather at the time, it'll, it'll give information and, and um, control the system and also inform um, the farmers about it. So that's, those are my slides. I'm gonna, I'll just have a quick check at the Q&A and um, these are, um, So a smart mask, there's a question here, what's the difference between a smart mask and an ordinary mask? And well, the smart mask would have something in it that might measure um, people's breathing rate. So an ordinary mask, um, an ordinary one, it would just be filtering out, so stopping um, coughs or particles, droplets going through it. Um, the idea of a smart mask is there's some technology there that will enhance the function in some way. So it might be monitoring somebody's um, breathing. I think in the future, like breath is very, uh, can give a lot of health information. Um, and even there, there's been recent studies looking at a dog smelling COVID. So by actually having chemical sensors, there's lots of things in your breath that could tell you something about your health. And um, there's some other questions, but I might hand over to Rajani and um, and we can go through these. There's some kind of general questions about electronic engineering. So I'll hand yep. over to Rajani for now. Okay, okay, I'll just. Okay. So hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, yeah, Rajani. I am also a, a researcher in the School of Electronic Engineering, DCU. So before going through the slides, maybe I'll just, uh, I have a couple of questions, polls for you. Maybe I'll just put it there. Regarding global warming. Have you heard about global warming? Okay, it's good. Okay, I'll end the poll now. So it's like six. Okay. That's very good. Like uh, very aware of 67% very aware. Now I have one more question for you here. Have you heard about renewable energy? That's very good, everyone knows, most of them knows. Most of you know, that's very good. So it's very easy. So you will understand like what you, you know, it's very, I'll just go through the slides now. Okay.
so uh, during this talk i will be uh, going through i will uh, address some of the important uh, global challenges where engineering can contribute very well to that significantly to that so uh, there are three grand challenges energy food and water and among these energy is central to the sustainable development now recent results uh, recent research found that by 2050 we will need 40 percentage more water 50 percentage more energy and 60 percentage more food now if you look at a big picture this is a global energy consumption in uh, 2018 if you look at this more than 85 percentage of global energy consumption is from carbon dioxide emitting fossil fuels and only nearly four percentage is from carbon free renewable energy and we know that this carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that means it absorbs more uh, heat and causes global warming and if there is an increase of uh, this global average temperature of greater than two degrees celsius uh, compared to the pre-industrial period that will cause very serious and irreversible damage to the environment now if you look at the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere this is the this is the carbon dioxide level we have for many years and we can see that the carbon dioxide level had never been above this 300 parts per million this is the levels of carbon dioxide and this 2 degree increase of global average temperature rise corresponds to a carbon dioxide level of nearly 450 parts per million in the atmosphere that means when we reach that 450 we will get up to that we will pass that 2 degree average temperature rise now uh, if you look at this 1950 level we have this is we already started increasing the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere and at the current time like in 2020 or this is the current level of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere you can see that it is very close to 420 parts per million that means if we keep on uh, burning fossil fuel like this we will reach that 450 parts per million limit by nearly 2050 itself that is a very alarming situation and let's look at the uh, global increase of global average temperature this is the increase of global average temperature and you can see that if we go like this we will reach that two degree celsius in uh, global average temperature rise by 2060 itself so we have to limit that level well below this two degree celsius that is the reason why paris climate uh, agreement is to keep that rise of global average temperature well below two degrees celsius now there are uh, huge impacts of this global warming and uh, we will look at some of the major impacts associated with that very severe uh, weather situations weather events extreme weather events like droughts heat waves and storms etc will continue uh, to occur in a more frequently as well as in a more intense way like very strong uh, way and also if we have uh, this uh, continuous long uh, droughts and heat waves that will cause frequent wildfires as well as another impact is the melting of polar ice and glaciers and uh, the rising of sea levels that will cause the uh, that will erase uh, many of the coastal cities around the world and also another thing is the loss of biodiversity so this will cause and this global warming is a kind of major cause of this massive extinction of many animal and plant species and you can see a picture here this is a very uh, very thin you can see a very horribly thin uh, polar bear that doesn't have if the ice melts that doesn't have food or place to go so what happens is that eventually these kind of these species will extinct now uh, at this situation engineers and engineering solutions have uh, are key to uh, address these issues to mitigate global warming for example this uh, a rapid transition from this uh, carbon dioxide emitting fossil fuels to the uh, renewable and sustainable energy sources is really important let's look at the what are the clean energy resources available to us these are some examples of clean energy resources that we have already we have light energy from sun and heat as well as some vibrational energies and movement of wind and waves so we have huge amount of clean energy available in the nature so if we if we have 
is to harvest these clean energies to useful forms of like electrical energy that will uh, really help to uh, address the energy demands for us. Okay, and huge thanks to the advancements of science and engineering to uh, develop this clean energy and uh, harvesting technologies that will help to meet our energy demands. Now let's look at some of the energy harvesting technologies. So renewable energy is one of the most important technologies to address climate change. And this renewable energy can be harvested from renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, and wave, etc. And here you can see an example of solar energy system. And this uh, solar energy can be produced or using solar cells, we can convert the light energy from sun to electrical energy. And this is an example of a largest floating solar uh, system solar uh, energy system located in, on the, on, in France, that is the Europe's largest one. And in the case of wind energy, this kinetic energy of the wind, that means wind is actually the moving air, and the kinetic energy of that can be harvested using wind turbines to useful form of energy, that is electrical energy. And this is the conventional uh, wind turbines that we use. And this is a new form of uh, wind turbine, and that's called wind trees that is installed by a company called New Wind. And in the case of wave energy, there are various forms of uh, harvesting wave energy. This is an example here. This is called point absorber. So what this do here is that will absorb the kinetic energy of the waves moving uh, water or wave and convert that into electrical energy. And apart from this renewable energy source, there are other non-natural clean energy sources as well. Let's look at some examples here. So it's very interesting that uh, nearly 70% of the all energy produced by the humanity is wasted as heat. That's me that means we have waste heat everywhere. Whenever we do any work or start or run any machine or engines, we produce heat. So there are weight, a lot of waste heat available to harvest. So if uh, the engineers developed a technology to harvest this or uh, this waste heat into electricity. And this can be done using uh, some technologies based on some materials called thermo thermoelectric material as well as pyroelectric materials. So these are the materials that can convert that can uh, convert this heat energy into electrical energy. On the left hand side, you can see an example. It's a, this is a wearable uh, thermoelectric generator that is developed in KAIST, South Korea. And that is used to harvest thermal energy from uh, human skin. And this, is a, this can be uh, used for uh, powering small mobile electronic devices such as uh, medical sensors or uh, smart watches, etc. And the right hand side is an example showing a pipe generator used to uh, harvest waste heat from industries to electricity. And there are other forms of energy such as vibrational or mechanical energy. So this vibrational and mechanical energy can be harvested using a material or a technology called piezoelectric material or piezoelectric electric technologies. And these are a couple of examples here that shows in the left hand side, you can see this is an example showing energy has harvesting floor or energy harvesting tiles that will absorb the kinetic energy from the food steps and that convert into electrical energy. And here on the right hand side, you can see energy harvesting roads. And this is a speed bump and that will convert the kinetic energy from the you know, vehicle tires into electrical energy. Now let's see, uh, you know, we can, we can, let's see how we can uh, use all these concepts into uh, in, and incorporate into a sustainable uh, aspect. Let's see that. And uh, if you look at the sustainable design, what is, what do you mean by sustainable design? So actually this sustainable design is a uh, way of life. It's a kind of how we live our life, which, which aims to create communities, buildings, and products that contribute to the sustainability vision. Now, if you look at the uh, energy consumption of Europe in uh, 2017, you can see that the building sector has the largest energy consumption. Okay, that means, and they, they, these buildings, they use it for heating, cooling, as well as for operating energy appliances, etc. And uh, since they are the largest consumers, these buildings needs to be in a, uh, these buildings should have a sustainable design to 
uh, so that they have to uh, they should be uh, in a very energy if they should build in a they should design such a way that they have the best energy efficiency as well as they have to use uh, renewable energy sources to uh, meet their energy demands and conserve water etc and here the, there are some examples of uh, sustainable i mean some building designs they are sustainable designs and you can see this is an example like uh, it's a vertical garden or hanging garden from one central park sydney australia and there is another one here it's a uh, public library taipei public library and in both these buildings uh, they use uh, they they are made up of like they have a eco friendly design and also they use renewable they depend on renewable energy uh, resources for their energy and as well as they both have some uh, capability to uh, capture rainwater for to meet their water needs so these are some examples of sustainable design now uh, in dcu we do a, a lot of very exciting and interesting innovative research projects to meet many of these global challenges for example uh, we develop renewable energy harvesting technologies here such as solar cells and other uh, thermoelectric generators etc and also we develop technologies and materials for uh, water purification uh, energy storage application as well as uh, some uh, technologies and materials for wide range of sensor applications as well so thank you very much and if you have any we will address all your if you have questions thanks rajani if um some questions here in the chat um so question did you take electronic yeah. engineering um so i did i did uh, electronic engineering in dcu actually um and i did a phd in biomedical engineering and then just to say i also um did a diploma in fashion design in the grafton academy and um, so that's sort of how i ended up doing wearable technology um i know rajani i think Sorry, physics. You want to? Yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, I did my uh, master's in physics, but I did PhD in electronic engineering, and I I work with wide range of materials for di different applications like energy, uh, energy storage, then uh, sensors, and uh, water purification. All these things. So I love to work with materials.